last year I invented a way to design new medicines by looking at tiny proteins through a mirror. And I'm going to explain to you how, in my previous life as a climber and an adventurer, this is what led me to make this discovery. So it all started when I was about 13 years old, and my friend Dan and I uh, climbed this railway cutting near where I grew up in England. And it was horribly loose. Everything we touched fell off, and it created this pile of rocks at the bottom. And as ours was the only such pile, pile we figured that we were probably the first people to ever climb this. Um, and I think from then on, for about the, the next 10 years, I, all I could think about was climbing an adventure. And eventually I got pretty good at climbing and I was able to establish new climbs up more uh, aesthetically pleasing cliffs. And this is one of the proudest moments of my teenage when I fr a free soloed a first ascent that got noticed by and got into the climbing magazine. And, and while I mainly climbed with other people, I was particularly fascinated by solo climbing and it was a particularly personal and amazing experience to climb solo. So, British climbs are generally quite short. There are no really big cliffs in, in the UK. And eventually I started to feel like I needed bigger adventures. And so when I was about 20 or 21, I, I turned the calendar over at home and I saw this exact picture of the, the Matterhorn in Switzerland, this iconic mountain. And this was about 20 times bigger than anything I'd ever done before. And um, none of my friends were really want, wanted to do this. So uh, the idea started to emerge that maybe I should go out and try and solo this. But I didn't have any of the right clothing or the right equipment. I really didn't know what I, was, what I would face up there. Um, but I, I borrowed, I borrowed um, different sleeping bags. I bought ice axes and crampons from eBay. I learned how to, cl to ice climb by climbing oak trees in my local park with uh, the local kids throwing stones at me, which was good training. <laughs> and uh, eventually I got out and got out and started to climb the Matterhorn. And so the first thing I got up to was um, these sort of crumbling, creaking uh, ice cliffs that I had to climb beneath. And it was absolutely terrifying. The, the, uh, all you could hear was this kind of deep groaning noise as these cliffs got ready to fall on you. So I'm kind of sprinting through this as fast as I possibly can go. And then finally I get to this bit which looks really safe and this kind of ice sheet and I'm walking along feeling a bit more relieved. But then suddenly my feet just drop through the ice. And unbeknownst to me, there's this huge, the, the whole thing is riddled with glaciers. And I go from sprinting to, um, to creeping, I go from sprinting to um, creeping across the ice like Pink Panther. And um, then I got to the rock climbing bit, uh, which I thought was going to be really easy um, because I, that's what I did all the time. But actually, it turned out it was really hard to climb with a big rucksack on with a sleeping bag and all the climbing equipment. So I ended up just burying that in the snow and carried on climbing without the equipment. And for that reason, I had to spend the next two days and two nights without a sleeping bag absolutely freezing and I, was, I ended up climbing too fast so I got sick with altitude and the whole thing was just four days of endless harrowing misery all the all the time just saying to myself why am I doing this and just desperately wishing I could be anywhere but here but eventually I got up I managed to get up and back down to the bottom again and it was it was at this point um, when I, I looked back up at the look back up at the mountain I was able to just appreciate the epic adventure and life-changing experience that I just had it was just so far removed from the, from the mundane and ordinary, or, ordinary life. And even on the flight on the way back home, I was already starting to think what the next big adventure might be. So a couple of years later, after climbing sort of incrementally improving my climbing, in 2006, I found out about something which was, would be the next big leap for me, um, the kind of ultimate adventure. I came across the Troll Wall in Norway. And this is, this is the highest wall in Europe. It's uh, 1,100 meters high. It's overhanging, it's twice the height of the CN Tower. And it's generally agreed to be one of the hardest, most dangerous and terrifying cliffs in the world. And the, the main face of it had never been climbed solo, so there was just no way that I wasn't going to go out and try this. So I figured out it would take me about a week or 10 days to climb it, and there were no real ledges to speak of, so you have to carry this portable ledge to sleep on. This is me looking back down at my hanging campsite um, on, a, on a kind of practice run. Um, and you have to carry all of, all of the, the, the hanging ledge, your food, fuel, water, for the entire 10 days. Um, so you have this huge bag called a haul bag that you pack everything in and you drag up with you. So I drove all the way out to Norway. It was two days driving and ferry to get there from England and scrambled up this horrendous slope of loose boulders for about 20 hours, dragging this enormous bag with everything in it. And I'd heard the troll wall was pretty prone to the odd loose rock. And on day one, I found out what the odd loose rock really meant. And so I'm going to show you this video. And this, 
This was actually filmed well, on one of the days I was climbing the wall. It was filmed from about a mile away, but I think you'll get a sense of what it was like. So, it was a tad scary seeing that come towards you. <laughs> so I kind of pulled my whole bag over my head and sat there. And I remembered that Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep on going. But then I remembered that he was drunk most of the time, so I forgot that and <laughs> went back down again. And so I got back down into the valley and uh, I spent the next few days looking up at the, up at the cliff. I, I, f I found a guy who had a tele saw a guy on the side of the road who had a telescope, so I borrowed this telescope and I, was, I checked out the, the route that I was going to climb. And I figured that if I stayed over to the left of all this rockfall, that I'd probably be okay. So I, I went back up again, 20 hours back up again, and this time I'm just really determined to push through the fear. And uh, this is me cooking up some breakfast on a hanging stove in my uh, hanging campsite. And uh, so in order to keep yourself safe when you're climbing with walls, you have to make your own equipment and modify your own devices because so few people do this kind of climbing that you can't buy this stuff off the peg. Um, so this is, a, this is a device that I've modified to do this. And you carry a rope with you. It feeds down through, out of a rucksack on your back, down through this device and down to an anchor point. And if you fall off, this device jams and hopefully saves you from hitting the floor. So I'm, one day I'm on this route and I'm climbing, I'm climbing. And um, suddenly the rock that I'm climbing on starts making a noise and moving. And it sounds like someone's sliding a manhole cover off. And before I can get out of the way, the whole thing comes loose and drags me off the wall. And um, I just keep, I just plummet down and just keep going and going and going. I can feel all my equipment ripping out of the wall. I'm going down 20 meters, 30 meters. I've, I've never fallen this far before. It's absolutely terrifying. And, I don't know if this device is going to work. So I don't know how long later it was, but I, I wake up and I'm, uh, I'm looking at this amazing view. Actually, it looked like this because I was upside down. Um, and I remember that I'd fallen off. And I remembered that the troll on the troll wall, you can't get rescued. They, they refuse to do rescues on this face. So I started to think about how I was going to rescue myself. And I think one of the, one of the really critical requirements when you're doing a mountain rescue. I don't know if, any, if anyone here has done a mountain rescue, you'll know this. One of the critical requirements when performing any kind of mountain rescue is the ability to move your arms and legs. And uh, I was struggling with this. And I, I realized that it slowly dawned on me that I'd broken my neck and that I was paralyzed from the neck down. So you can kind of imagine the kind of thoughts you have when you're lying up there upside down, paralyzed from the neck down. I remember thinking, oh, fiddlesticks. <laughs> and um, but the good news was that if I, I figured out that if I bashed my head against the wall, I could knock myself unconscious and not have to go through a horrible, agonizing death. So I did try this, um, but I just ended up, because I had a climbing helmet on, giving myself a headache. So it was just one thing after the, after the other. You know, it was really turning into one of those days. Um, but fortunately, unbeknownst to me, uh, the guy that I'd borrowed a telescope from a few days earlier had gathered a bunch of his friends, and they, they decided to watch me do this climb. And they saw me hanging there, and they alerted the authorities, and the military came and got me. Uh, so I'd seen quite a few airlifts before, and I don't know if you've seen them, but you, usually when, when they do an airlift, uh, they kind of spend a long time, paramedics and the rescue team, putting you on a spinal board, very carefully putting, inflating uh, special collars and things. But on the troll wall, uh, you have to just be gotten off really, really fast. So they have to cut a few corners. So I'm going to show you this video, and I want you to just try and see where they've cut corners to save time. So I hadn't showered for a few days, so they made me stay outside. <laughs> anyway, so I finally got to the hospital, and uh, I was in quite a state. Um, I needed to be resuscitated 16 times with a defibrillator. And uh, I was in a coma for two weeks and on a life support machine for a few months. And, I, and then I essentially was in hospital for a year. And when I got out of hospital, I really, really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I'd been working as a research and development chemist um, before this accident. But it really wasn't practical to go back into that. And it was kind of difficult to find things in life to get excited about when you can't move. And I tried a few different things. I actually tried skydiving and skiing, sailing, and uh, wheelchair rugby. And they were all quite good, but I just kind of felt like a passenger, like I needed loads of help to do it, 
And uh, I really wanted to find something where I could, do, I could do that was more independent. So a few months after leaving hospital, I, uh, I went back to university and uh, did a master's and a PhD. And I was kind of, I, I was never into computers before this, but I was now forced to use a computer to do the research. So I learned how to, use to, how to control a computer using my voice. And um, the most interesting thing I could think to work on was 3D protein structures, which you kind of play around with on a computer screen. And I guess when most of you think of proteins, you probably think about milk and eggs and meat and probably bodybuilding. But when you, when you zoom in to about a millionth the, the millionth size of a, of a pinhead, um, you see that proteins are actually these really amazing tiny machines. I'm not a bodybuilder, by the way. I'm going to ask that quite a bit. Um, so these are a few examples of the, what I mean. Uh, on the left, you see this is a protein called GFP. And this, this is a really amazing little protein that makes some, some animals like jellyfish glow in the dark. And in the middle, we have a protein called rhodopsin. And this, this is inside all of your retinas. And it changes shape when the light hits it. And it's how you're seeing me right now. And finally, on the right, there's a, a, a protein called um, cryptochrome. And this has long been known to control our body clock. But just recently, actually just in the last year or so, it's also been found to help birds um, navigate in their migration. All of these um, protein structures come from this really fantastic resource called the Protein Data Bank. And it contains over 100,000 different protein structures from all across nature, representing millions of different proteins that give us all of the remarkable phenomena that we see in the living world. And throughout my master's and PhD, I really, I really dig, dug into this, this protein data bank and um, fell in love with these tiny structures. And uh, by the end of my PhD, I figured out that what I really wanted to do was try to make medicines out of proteins. So in 2013, I came to Toronto and designed, I got to design a few individual proteins, primarily for cancer treatment. Um, but one thing I, I, I ran up against time and time again was that proteins are not, in, in some ways, not very good as medicines because they, as soon as you put them in your body, um, your body is designed to uh, break down food and proteins. So they just get immediately destroyed by digestive enzymes and or by the immune system. But there, there is another feature of proteins that makes them, that we could potentially exploit to overcome this. And that's that they can all exist in either a left-handed or right-handed form, two mirror image forms. And it turns out that the entirety of nature, including you and me, is made of only left-handed proteins. And so if you make a right-handed version of a protein and put it into your body, it, it's actually invisible to the enzymes, digestive enzymes in your immune system. And so it doesn't get degraded. So the only, the only problem is, though, is that when you convert a left-handed protein to a right-handed, it also loses its original function. So you maybe find something, say, slows al Alzheimer's progression, and you want to make it stable. You turn it into a right-handed protein, and you do make it stable, but then you've lost this Alzheimer's treatment um, functionality. So around about this time, I'd uh, been trying my hand at stone sculpture. Uh, well, rather, my mouth at stone sculpture. I was, wanted to sculpt sort of human features, and to sculpt this right ear, I, decided, I, I figured out I could look at my left ear through a mirror. So I was, I was looking at my left ear in order to get the form of the right ear. And it got me to thinking that maybe we can put the whole protein data bank in the mirror. And, and by doing that, we'll, we will get every, every, all of the 100,000 proteins will become right-handed proteins and highly stable. Of course, they will have all lost their original function. But maybe amongst this 100,000, we can find some that have new medically interesting functions. So it turned out, however, when I started to try and do this, that when you, when you reverse everything and put it through the mirror, that all of the tools and things that I'd learned over the years, or most of them, no longer worked. Um, and so this was going to be a huge project. It would take probably years. And um, there was a really, really high chance that after all of that work, we would find nothing. And I don't think anyone else would have wanted to do this project, not, not in a million years. But for me, it was kind of the first time since the Troll War that I'd seen an opportunity to take on a really, really big challenge that there was a really big chance that nothing would work, but just, just to do it because it was my idea and to just do it for the, for this, for the fun of it, for the sake of it. Like climbing, um, I had to kind of make a lot of my own equipment, uh, my own tools to do this. I had to borrow things. And um, like climbing, there was a lot of setbacks. I made loads of stupid mistakes. But eventually, we managed to get something working. And now I'm kind of looking back at this. So it's sort of the same point as looking back up at the Matterhorn, having found a dozen proteins in this new repository, and more and more all the time. And there, we've got candidates for diabetes treatment, for cancer treatment, osteoporosis. And we have them working in living cells. We've got interest from Google, 
from um, Big Pharma, from the military. And there's a company in the US that's licensing it. And so it's been really exciting. And I think when I first started, um, I started sorry, when I started up the troll wall, I thought it would lead to this really exciting life of doing big expeditions in the Himalayas and Antarctica. But even though I failed so spectacularly, and I don't think anybody here is ever going to fail that hard at anything, it ended up leading to what I think is a different but equally exciting life. I'm actually working on far bigger challenges. So I now have my own lab in biomedical engineering at U of T. And uh, together with my team, we're designing living cells to tackle challenges like diabetes, heart failure, and inflammatory disease. And um, so the adventure continues. Thank you.